Hello, everyone, and welcome to CBA's At The Bar, a podcast where young and youngish lawyers discuss legal news, events, topics, stories, and whatever else strikes our fancy. I'm your host, John Amarillo of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister, and co-hosting the pod with me today is Carl Newman of the City of Chicago Corporation Counsel's Office for at least a few more weeks anyway. Hello, <laughs> Carl. Hi, John. <laughs> So, Carl, we have a big interview ahead of us today. We're joined by retired judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, Richard Posner. Before he retired last September, Judge Posner was arguably the best-known appellate judge in the country, often referred to as the Tenth Justice of the Supreme Court. His voluminous body of work essentially defined a judicial philosophy, often referred to as judicial realism, at least by its supporters. In fact, according to the Journal of Legal Studies, Judge Posner is the most cited legal scholar of the 20th century, writing more than 3,300 judicial opinions and, I just learned, 66 books. (laughs) He's currently a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago and has begun his own law firm as well. Judge Posner is known for his often brilliant and just as often controversial statements and opinions, recently stating that the U.S. Supreme Court is mediocre and highly politicized, (laughs) and previously describing the same court as awful and at its nadir. (laughs) Comments like that have made him beloved by many and not so beloved by others. But no matter which side of that divide you may stand on, hearing from Judge Posner is always an interesting and educational experience. Judge. Welcome, Nat, the bar. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have more topics that we'd like to cover today than we have time to do so. But we thought we'd lead today off by speaking to you about your views on pro se litigants. For our audience, those are non-lawyers who represent themselves in legal disputes and how they're treated in our legal system. You've been very outspoken on this subject of late, especially since your retirement. And my first question to you is pretty straightforward. Why? Well, eventually, I mean, I was I was on the court for 35 and two-thirds years, <laughs> and eventually, toward the end of that period, uh, I realized we weren't we weren't treating the pro ses properly. Now, about half of the appellants to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals are pro se, and of the pro ses, about half are prison inmates. Uh, a pro se is. It's actually, it's a Latin expression, means for yourself. So a pro se is just someone who, who d- does not have a lawyer and as a result is litigating for himself. So they're handicapped because most of these people have no legal training, legal insights. If they were successful people, they would have lawyers. If they don't have a lawyer, can't afford a lawyer. Uh, they're sort of, you know, much lower down on the social scale. And that's a big handicap for them. But I realized eventually we we just weren't treating them properly, asking too much of them. By that you mean holding them to the same standards you hold lawyers to? Yes. My sense was that most of the judges, they thought that a federal court should not have these people who aren't don't have lawyers, often not educated, often they're prison. They shouldn't be in a federal court. That somehow undermine the dignity. Federal court should be for big criminals <laughs> and <laughs> wealthy people with brilliant lawyers. Um, or at least lawyers. Or at least lawyers. So that's that's when. I, so I made a number of suggestions for how we could treat pro ses and. Uh, they were all turned down. What were some of those suggestions? Well, one is the um, the way it works. When the pro se appeals to the Court of Appeals, he, very rarely are they, are they women, he'll have, you know, appeal papers of some sort and uh, will submit those. And those papers are then given to what are called staff attorneys who are like law clerks, but they're not hired by individual judges. They're hired by the court as a whole, by a person who runs the staff attorney program. So they're given the papers, and they're told to write a summary, a recommendation, or or it could be a, a draft order, how they think the case should be decided. The recommendation order goes to a three judge panel, which then decides what to do. So the problem is that while about half the staff attorneys write well, (laughs) the other half don't write well. 
which means that uh, half the time the judges are getting documents suggesting how they should rule, but not clearly written. They could always, you know, call up the staff attorney and ask, what do you mean? Can you be clear about this? But they don't bother because they, want to, they don't want to spend time on pro se's. So that's one mistake. Another, which is a little subtler, is that all of the pro se's appear to have heard of the term habeas corpus. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and it's very, very difficult to get federal habeas corpus. And so the pro se's who ask for habeas corpus, who are numerous, are always turned down. What I said, what I suggested without success, was that the staff attorney, <clears throat> when she's the habeas corpus, should look very carefully at the papers filed by the pro se to see whether the pro se may actually have a good case but he shouldn't be asking for habeas corpus. And in a case like that, the staff attorney should tell the judges, tell the pro se that he may have a good case, but he made a mistake in labeling it habeas corpus. And then you'd want to go on and explain why you think it might be a good case. What could he have asked for that a court might grant him? And you would put that in an order? Like an advisory yeah, opinion? Exactly, yeah. And so essentially yeah. give them another shot. Right. Okay. Right. Now, the other thing is that I think I said about half the recommendation orders or draft recommendation memos or draft orders of the staff attorneys are well written. The other half are not well written. And I suggested that I review all the staff attorney recommendation memos or draft orders before they went to the judges, and I'd make sure they were competently drafted. So that was turned down. <laughs> and you met with quite a bit of pushback from what I've heard on that, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, in, in fairness um, to the other side, that would essentially put you in charge of half the court's docket, right? One judge? Uh, yes, that's right. On the other hand, I was the only judge who was interested in the process. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So, well, I, I want to go back for a second, Judge, because it seems to me like uh, you know your concerns. I want to sort of understand what the concern is. Is the concern the treatment that they receive, as opposed to the results that they're getting? And what I mean is, you know, the Illinois Supreme Court for a while now has been on this kick based on a report about how people perceive the legal system. And one of the things that they learned in it is that literally if a judge just spends more time talking to a person in court, they're more likely to obey a court order they don't like. And so like that's a purely mm -hmm. treatment-based question. The other side is results. And so the question is, are pro se litigants losing cases they ought to be winning? Because I will say, as a person who was interviewed for your book because I was a staff clerk <laughs> in a different circuit, you know, I took the pro se appeals that I worked on very, very seriously. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how they could possibly have a claim. But the truth is that a lot of their cases are meritless. Oh, yeah, There's no law true. for yeah. it. And so, you know, I guess my question is, is the problem that the pro se litigants aren't being treated well and it's resulting in the wrong outcome or that they aren't being treated very well and they ought to just be treated better because the court system ought to treat them better? Well, I, I'd, I'd, answer, I'd answer it a little differently. Most of the pro se appeals should lose, should fail. I don't know what percentage, but a significant percentage should fail. A majority should fail. But that leaves a substantial number that are potentially meritorious. They need to have some help, say, from the staff attorneys who will explain their case in a way that the judges understand. Judges aren't, uh, judges aren't actually going to read the pro se materials. And if the recommendations that the judges get are realistic and reasonable and articulate and so on, then the judges in my court, I think in most court, they will still turn down most of the appeals from the pro se's, but a few will get through. The most serious problem is simply that the judges don't really think the pro se's belong in a federal court. They should have some lesser form of relief in some other 
part of the government. That's the most serious problem. Now, actually, my experience, pro se's, not in a majority of cases, but not infrequently, have, have a good case. Now, one of the complications, and it's not well understood, is that often, actually, it's the, the pro se is better off without a lawyer. The pro se who gets a lawyer and then thereby ceases to be a pro se in the technical sense is often going to lose because he's going to have one lawyer. And it's a lawyer who caters to pro se, so maybe not a very good lawyer. That's what he has. And the other side is probably going to have more than one lawyer and they're going to be better lawyers. That's a very bad position for the pro se to be in and dooms a great many pro se cases. Isn't that true of the legal system in general, though? Poor lawyers going up against better lawyers, better funded lawyers. John and I are putting ourselves in the latter category. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. But here, here's, the, here's the answer. The answer is for the pro se not to have a lawyer. So one of the people in my firm, you know, because I have a firm now mainly for pro se's. I don't want to talk about that in a minute. Oh, well, I don't want to. Uh... No, no, please. Yeah. So anyway, this fellow now works for me, Brian Vukadinovich. So uh, he was a high school teacher and a basketball coach in northern Indiana. And uh, he was fired by the school board. Apparently, according to Brian, northern Indiana is very corrupt. <laughs> so, so he was very angry at being fired. So he sued. He didn't want to have a lawyer. He has no legal training, no legal background. He did not want to have a lawyer. He wanted to do it himself. He asked for a jury, got a jury. The trial judge, whom I know, a very good federal district judge named Phil Simon. Phil Simon didn't like Brian at the trial. <laughs> But the jury liked him, and the jury awarded him $203,000 in damages wow. <laughs> against the school board. <laughs> so, and Phil Simon, I, mean, I don't think he was pleased, <laughs> but he didn't want to interfere with the jury verdict. So Brian Vukadinovich walks away with $203,000. Uh, and this was written, there were articles about this. I, I learned about them. I wrote them. And uh, the next thing he did, he wrote a pro se manual. Oh. It's very well written. It covers everything in a trial. And it's designed for the pro se who does not want to have a lawyer. It tells him every step of the way what you have to know. You have to know, you have to know about discovery. You have to know about damages. You know, you have to listen to the judge. You have to do this and that and the other thing. It goes through everything. It's very well written. And I think I think there's a lot to the idea that the pro se, see, I think what happens, probably may have happened in Brian in Vukadinovich's case, uh, the jury sees that the, the plaintiff does not have a lawyer. It's one person. And then they see the defendant, which is usually a fat cat of some sort of company, government, has uh, multiple lawyers. Well, that's bad optics. <laughs> and the jury is likely to say, well, you know, the plaintiff, not a lawyer or anything, but he seemed to be leveling with us. He seemed to know what he was talking about. He seemed like a nice person. Mm -hmm. And they... Lawyers for the defendants, for the fat cat, eh, very attractive. So there so may we'll, be a David and Goliath narrative <laughs> exactly, playing out there. Yeah. Exactly. So, so one of the things I'm emphasizing in my little company is uh, making effort. I mean, you're not going to turn every pro se into an effective, you know, self-litigator. But uh, when you meet these people, you know, you want to get a sense what they are. These, is this someone who could turn into an effective uh, spokesman in front of a jury? What would jurors think of this person? That's, sure. that's very important. Not just automatically giving him a lawyer.
Because also, if you decide to give the pro se a lawyer, the chances are you'll be giving him a lawyer who is part of the kind of pro bono, you know, pro se domain. This is, this is his specialty. He helps mm -hmm. out these people. And uh, he may be jaded or he may be doing this because he really isn't a very good lawyer. And Doesn't this have any other options, huh? Yeah. So, because there are a lot of lawyers like that, uh, the pro se will often be better off without a lawyer. That's interesting. So let me, because that was actually one of my questions is sort of why isn't the answer just more lawyers? Um, but, <laughs> yeah, right. but, but so I would say, you know, maybe for the, you know, about 20% of federal appeals are direct criminal appeals. And those are, you know, not all, but a lot of them are publicly provided, publicly yes. funded lawyers. I guess, why isn't that the answer? At least why isn't it the answer for the roughly you know, 18, 20% of cases that are habeas. I mean, habeas is so highly specialized and EDPA makes it almost impossible for anybody to get relief. I can't imagine <laughs> that any pro se habeas appellant is ever going to win. <laughs> um, it seems to me like, shouldn't we just be talking about government funded lawyers for at least some of these cases? Well, in the case of the, the pro se clearly needs some preparation, even if he's going to be his own, his own lawyer. And one of the things he has to be told is forget about habeas corpus. That's a dead end. But maybe what that means is simply that a lot of pro se's can handle their own cases, but they have to be taught. They have to be helped. They can't just be thrown into the arena, you know. Like a... You know, one of the things that's striking, there are an enormous number of organizations that either provide lawyers for pro se's or they give money to the firms or individuals who uh, help pro se's. Like the Chicago Bar Foundation is a generous donor. But with all this, it's just a drop in the bucket. Right. Most of the pro se's do not have any uh, help. So I'm trying to, you know, Trying to help out. I'm trying to make this my little company. Let's talk about that. <laughs> First of all, what's the name? You have a law firm. Is it Posner LLC, Posner & Associates? Uh, originally, it was Pro Bono Pro Se Law Group. So you're going for the direct method. There. And, uh, and other people in my firm didn't like it, and they renamed it <laughs> Team Posner <laughs> Law Group Improving Access to American Courts. Very That's aspirational. The, Just so our audience knows, <laughs> the judge right. is blushing a little bit when he says that. That's the... Uh, that's and, and so how, how is this firm going to operate? Do you have a central office? Is it a network of volunteers? Are they all lawyers? How does it work? It's very much in its infancy. <laughs> For example, it doesn't have... It doesn't yet have a defined structure, so on, but those are details. That may be resolved tomorrow when I have a meeting with some people. That's a cliffhanger. So, That's a teaser right there <laughs> yeah. for our audience. So the idea is that it's to be a nationwide firm, not just a Chicago firm. It's to consist of lawyers, maybe the majority, but not by no means of all lawyers, and uh, people with diverse interests and talents and so on. And um, uh, I need donations, I need money so I can pay them. So at present I have, I have 32 people signed up for me. Uh, majority lawyers, but by no means all. And actually seven of them are my research staff at the University of Chicago Law School. They're students. They're great. Very, very valuable. Especially because they're working for free, right? <laughs> no, but they're paid by the law school. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just as good. So free for you. <laughs> free, for, free for me, yeah. So it's been interesting meeting either on telephone, sometimes uh, in person, these people from all over the country. Can I ask you about one yeah. of them that I read about? Uh, William Bond. Uh huh. He's a controversial guy from what I've been reading. You volunteered to help represent him in the Fourth Circuit in a pending right. case he has. He's a homeless former writer and tennis pro, as I understand it. 
He's currently litigating a case in the Fourth Circuit, as I said, and he is accusing the federal trial judge who heard his case of colluding with the FBI. Is the article I read accurate there? Uh, that, that strikes I, me as uh, yeah. I wouldn't put it quite that way. What happened to him? He started off by suing uh, the Baltimore city government on the ground that the Baltimore city government is corrupt. <laughs> A wide Anyone who's view. watched The Wire knows <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, according to him, the Justice Department, for some reason, got annoyed with him. And they started sending agents to his apartment who would, you know, they'd ask questions like, do you keep firearms in your apartment? They say no. But they they would be asking provocative questions suggesting maybe they knew something and so on. So that made him very angry. So he brought a federal suit against, maybe this suit against Baltimore might have been federal, but he brought a federal suit against these agents, maybe against the whole Justice Department. And um, the district judge assigned to the case was very hostile to him and uh, threw out his case. So he appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He, uh, he just sent me an email out of the blue. This is at least probably two months ago, uh, asking for could I help him. I asked him to send me his papers. He'd file complaints and so on. And... Um, I realized when I read his stuff that although he has no background in law, I don't know what kind of education he has, he's a very skillful writer. <laughs> I mean, he wrote his second amended complaint in his suit against these Justice Department his officers. It was really well done. I heard it read like a screenplay. <laughs> so, uh, but I, you know, I gave him some pointers. He asked me to file a brief with the... Fourth Circuit. And I said, well, I'm not a member of the Fourth Circuit. And he said, well, but you could probably, since you're, you know, just retired as a judge and, and belong to another bar, you could probably ask them to waive you in for just this case. So I said, well, actually, I'm not a member of any bar. I used to be a member of the New York Bar, but uh, which I joined in 1963. But I gave that up a long time <laughs> ago when I became a judge. Next thing I know, he sends me a detailed statement by the New York Bar about me, in which it says, correctly, I was uh, admitted to the New York Bar in 1963. Uh, I have remained a member in good standing <laughs> ever <laughs> since. There are no disciplinary <laughs> complaints against me. So the New York Bar has just not learned that I had retired from the New York Bar many years ago. <laughs> so, but this is Bond, you know? He's, he's ingenious, he's innovative, he's energetic, and he's gotten me restored to yeah. <laughs> New York Bar without the New York Bar knowing what has happened. So is this Team Posner's first big <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, client? Yeah. So he also persuaded the clerk's office of the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit, a fellow named Judge Gregory. And um, he persuaded the clerk's office <laughs> to allow me to file a, a brief in support of a bond. But that was some time ago, and I, and I think it's just stalled. I mean, often things get slowed down in a court. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently it hasn't gotten anywhere. So bond is a character... And uh, he's also very interested in my cat. <laughs> so, so, you know, the way to your heart, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think he's playing on your Pixie, heartstrings there. Yeah. Pixie, who ran for president last year. I think not, a lot of us probably would have preferred if win. she won. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's going to she's gonna run again in 2020. Oh, okay. By which time we'll be fed up with human presence. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> she's a, she's a beautiful Maine coon. She's... She's very civilized, very intelligent, quiet, pleasant. All the things you're looking for in a president. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I think everyone yeah. could wish for that right so, now. So Bond is, knows about Pixie and is very emphatic that he wants, he wants me to send 
sent him a picture of Pixie. So I'm happy to do this. It says, but he says, the picture must be taken against a white background. So I'm not sure what, what to do That's about that. Curious. But I say, actually, the, the wall surfaces in our kitchen are white, probably white enough. But then we had this weather of last week, right? And now it's dark. Everything is dark. <laughs> For our audience who doesn't live in Chicago, we went from summer to winter in about a five-day period. It's a dark place. Oh. Yeah. So now I, I don't know what to do. I, I have to wait for the return of the sunlight. <laughs> he's, you know, he's he's harassing me. He wants that picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's and on that odd note, it's probably a good place to take a break. We'll be right back. This episode of At the Bar is brought to you by CBA Insurance Agency in partnership with Attorney Protective, part of the Berkshire Hathaway family, offering legal malpractice insurance. Attorney Protective has the experience, expertise, and financial stability to defend the strongest cases without limitation. It's your good name. Let us help you keep it. For a free price estimate, visit attorneyprotective.com backslash CBA podcast. Judge. One of the topics I really wanted to talk about with you today that is near and dear to both Carl and my heart as appellate lawyers is independent judicial research. Mm -hmm. For our audience, this is a phenomenon by which judges go beyond the record, that is beyond the facts that are introduced by the parties and their lawyers and the witnesses, to facts that the judges discover in their own investigation of a case. You've been a very big advocate of independent judicial research, saying that if parties don't like judges doing it, they should just be sure to include everything in their briefs and save you the bother. But if we're being fair about it, that kind of research, really, it does fly in the face of a long tradition of judges refraining in the American judicial system from looking beyond the record unless the fact at issue is so well established and uncontroversial that uh, the judge can safely take what's called judicial notice of the fact. Uh, would you explain our audience your views on judges doing their own research and how you came to them? Well, I, I'm a I'm a maverick, <laughs> and um, you know I I don't really like rules. I don't like tradition. I want to do what I think is sensible. So I had a case. I guess this is late 2016, uh, which I got into a big fight with another judge, David Hamilton. He's a very good judge, and I like him, but we got into a big fight. Talking about Roe? Yes, Roe versus Gibson. So this is a, this is a, a person in uh, a prison in the Indianapolis area, and he has um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, in a mild form, that's just, um, what is it, when your stomach... You have some acid in it. Yeah, heartburn. Heartburn, or, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But uh, uh, in, a, in a serious case, which this, which Roe had, the acid in your stomach backs up into your esophagus and can cause terrible damage, can cause cancer. And so there's Roe in prison. He's a bank robber, I think. And he has this disease. And there's a standard treatment uh, with Xanax, which is an over-the-counter pill you take. And um, for some reason, the prison doctor sounded like a nut. He, uh, he cut off uh, Rose Xanax. I think he cut it off for like two years. Uh, when he restored it after this interval, the schedule in the prison had gotten extraordinarily garbled. So he would have um, his breakfast at 4.30 a.m. and his lunch dinner at 4.30 p.m. So he wasn't getting Crazy pills at the stuff. appropriate time. And well, yeah, he was, he was getting the pills uh, several hours earlier. And if my research consisted in part walking into Walgreens and reading the Xanax uh, <laughs> about when to take it? Where they say, yeah, where they say, take it within a half hour or an hour before you eat. Mm -hmm. 
So it's clear that to uh, take it many hours, like 6.30 a.m. when you're not eating until, I don't know, noon or something, um, is, is very dangerous. So l reading the label, that was one piece of extrajudicial research. Another, though, was just um, looking at the uh, websites of reputable hospitals uh, asking them about when you should take your Xanax if you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, like the Mayo Clinic. Well, they say, you know, a half hour, an hour before. But the problem is that if you take it more than that, it kind of falls apart in that period. It, it, the Xanax doesn't remain uh, effective for an indefinite period. So I thought, how could we do better than with Mayo Clinic, and uh, I looked. I think I looked at the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic. You know, he's the best clinics in the country. But uh, David Hamilton, the dissenting judge, uh, thought this was very improper. The judge, throughout his case, Rowe's case, on the ground. I mean, this is really ridiculous. On the ground that uh, he didn't have a lawyer and he didn't have an expert witness. The only expert witness was this, uh, I thought, rather crazy prison doctor. So the third judge on the panel agreed with me, and there was a big fight in the in the Court of Appeals. Uh, several of the judges wanted to have rehearing on Bach. They sided with David Hamilton, but it didn't work. And uh, another thing, the district judge, the reason the district judge had not appointed a doctor for Roe said was that, well, you know, it's hard to find gastroenterologists. So I Googled gastroenterologists in the Indianapolis area. Answer, 128. <laughs> right? You remember that number very specifically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's just an example. The, the ordinary conventional methods of litigation will often not reveal essential facts which are actually easily obtained and unarguable. So that's the part I'd like to uh, talk to you about because I think the concern from the other side of the debate is that they may be easily obtained, but they are arguable. Did you see the recent ProPublica study of the U.S. Supreme Court decisions? No. On So ProPublica issued a study finding in cases where the justices appeared to be doing their own research on scientific or medical issues that they either well that they either did their own research on or they appeared to draw from Amici briefing and they found that the justices got it wrong more often than they got it right on medical and scientific issues and not just in minor cases either one of the cases they studied was Justice Roberts opinion in Shelby County versus Holder seminal decision striking down part of the Voting Rights Act. And he was citing voting registration data to support his contention that registration rates amongst blacks and whites in six southern states were comparable, when in fact, for a whole host of reasons, they were not. I think that, as I understand it, is the concern from people like Judge Hamilton, that judges, when they're doing their own research, perhaps unconsciously, are simply finding facts that support the view that they may already have in a case? Well, it depends on the court. Now, the Supreme Court is extremely weak. And if you want to, you want to talk about Justice Roberts, you can talk about his dissent in the Obergefell's case. Have you mm. read that? I have. Well, have you read the sentence in which he says that the Kalahari Bushmen, the Han Chinese... The Carthaginians and the Romans, not the Romans, Carthaginians and the Aztecs. The Carthaginians, the Aztecs, the Kalahari Bushmen, and the Han Chinese all believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. For our audience, this was the decision that ruled bans on uh, gay marriage unconstitutional. The la his last sentence is, who do we think we are? 
Now, actually, most of us think we are not Han Chinese, we are not <laughs> Bushmen, yeah. Yeah. we are not Carthaginians, we're not even Aztecs. So this was, I thought, one of the most preposterous sentences ever to appear in a judicial opinion. And, um, and if you do, re I did research, yeah, extrajudicial research. So... <laughs> there was an the eye roll there the, for everybody. The Han Chinese, very funny, the Han Chinese, there are actually two separate situations that are called Han Chinese. The Han are the uh, dominant component of the modern Chinese. So 90% of modern Chinese people are Han. But there was a Han dynasty between 200 BC and 200 AD, and in the Han dynasty, they were wild sexually. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know which Han I mean discussed. And then the Aztecs, when, uh, when you know... Big on human sacrifices, I recall. Well, they did that also, but when the Spanish you know, invaded Mexico, they were shocked by the amount of sodomy. <laughs> and then the Kalahari Bushmen, pathetic. You know, they're the southern, southernmost part of, of uh, Africa, and they're virtually extinct. <laughs> so, anyway, according to uh, Google, no one knows whether the Kalahari Bushmen actually have marital ceremonies. That's all they were to say about the Kalahari Bushmen. As for the Carthaginians, the only thing I found about the Carthaginians was a... Also uh, big in a human sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Was an Italian professor. And he said that, well, what happened when uh, Rome destroyed Carthage in 146 B.C., the Carthaginians were scattered over the Roman Empire and they infected the Romans with their sodomy. <laughs> and as a result, the Roman Empire fell. <laughs> this is some professor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow, that's so, so this is the back this is the back or the under underbelly of Robert's terrible. So maybe he picked some wrong examples <laughs> yeah, for his yeah. universal truth well, message. Let me, let me let me follow up on that though for a second because you know I think your intellectual legacy for judges is going to be legal realism and pragmatic judging as much as it is law and economics. I think. Here's my question though. I think there are a lot of judges who think they're doing what you do and they're not <laughs> very good at it. And I worry, you know, that the judges who are saying, well, I'm just trying to reach a reasonable result and I'm ignoring the precedent I don't like and I'm overlooking the facts that I don't want to put in the opinion because they're not good for the outcome I want. I think that they think they are doing pragmatic judging. I think that is exactly what they think they're doing. Um, and I wonder, you know, how do I, <laughs> one, when that's what everybody's doing, what do I tell my client when I'm trying to predict the outcome of a case? <laughs> yeah. And two... You know, how do I tell the good pragmatic judging from the actually you're just making it up? That's, that's a good question. But the, the only answer I have is when I see a case, to me what a case is, it's a dispute. Okay? Two people are disputing, two companies disputing. And um, when you have a dispute, in an ordinary dispute, you don't have lawyers, you don't have witnesses. You just have two people disputing and someone has to settle the dispute. The judge will just be asking himself or herself, who has the better argument? Who's being more sensible? Now, my view, that's, that's really all there is in law. I don't like the rules. I don't like the technicalities. I don't much like having the lawyers there. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not the first time I've heard you say that. <laughs> uh, actually, I have... I, I, one of the people on my staff is a lawyer in Chicago, but he has a very interesting idea, which I really like, and he says that in most cases, we should simply dispense with lawyers in the following sense. Uh, no lawyers would be permitted in the courtroom on either side, and the judge will just talk to ask questions, listen to the two parties, the two disputants, and figure out 
who makes the most sense. As you might do in a family, you have two kids are arguing with each other. You don't have a lawyer there, but you figure out one has the better of the argument. Um, so it's more of a mediation model yeah, for exactly, dispute resolution. Mediation, arbitration, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. And uh, I think a lot of judges would find that quite a relief from having to, it's not only having to listen to lawyers, but it's having to apply rules that judges may have an imperfect knowledge of, and a lawyer gets up and explains some complex rule. The judge doesn't really know what it means, what's going on. So you're saying, if I hear you correctly, that the formal aspects of the law are interfering with perhaps most practical or sensible ends to these disputes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And and um, I mean, you look at the Supreme Court, you mentioned the Supreme Court. Does it make any sense at all that there is no compulsory retirement age in the Supreme Court? I don't think it makes any sense. Or in the lower courts. So one of our, what, well, it's not my court anymore, but one of the judges in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals is 91. He's not enfeebled or anything like that. Uh, he doesn't seem any <laughs> different from when I started and he was on the court 37 years ago, almost 37 years. But uh, I don't think you should have judges of that age on a court. Even if, like Judge Bauer, all their faculties are there and they're still very sharp and able to perform the duties of their office? Um, uh, even so, because what it means is that you have a position being occupied by one person for uh, a, a very long time, and you'd think that if you had two people you know, splitting the... I mean, he's been a judge. Well, he's a district judge back in the 70s, so really going a long way. If you had successive judges within that period, if you had two judges, each serves for 20 years, they'd be fresher, they wouldn't get stale, they wouldn't get tired, bored. You have to worry. I mean, Judge Bauer does have good, you know, he's a very good memory and so on. But um, without becoming senile, people can certainly become stale because they've been doing the same thing for too long. I mean, I did it probably for too long, 35 and two-thirds years. And on the Supreme Court, you know, there has been, been a lot of octogenarians on the Supreme Court. You know, England, England didn't have a Supreme Court until very recently. They, they regarded Parliament as the Supreme Court, but now they have a Supreme Court. And when they set it up, they decided that judges would would have to retire at either 65 or 75, depending mm -hmm. on when they were appointed. I was just over there in the spring, actually, and got to meet several of them. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so it's a dynamic court, the way they have it set up. It's very interesting. That's interesting, because, of course, it's so novel. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's very good. So, um, yeah, I think there should be, you know, compulsory retirement in all the courts, 80 at the most. Um, mm -hmm. Well, even if not compulsory retirement, I mean, you can also have a norm where judges decide to retire or don't, you, could, you know, go yeah. out with their could feet be first. Custom, yeah. Do we still no. do norms in this country? I, we still have some. <laughs> we still have some. But And actually, I, I wanted to ask you this, um, you know, because it sounds you talked a little bit about your decision to retire. Um, but what's true for, I think, I would ask any federal judge who's retired in the last couple of months this question do you have any concerns about this particular president appointing your replacement, or is that just sort of like not part of the equation for you? Um, does it not make a difference, or is it factor in, but ultimately obviously didn't change your decision? So my my retirement created, you know, Judge Williams hasn't actually retired yet, but I think she's retiring this month, which is almost over. So treat her as a, so there are four vacancies. Now, one has been filled by Amy Barrett of mm -hmm. no Notre Dame. I think she's been confirmed, hasn't she? She has been. She has yeah. been, yeah. And then I think one other was nominated. Maybe? It's a nominee from Wisconsin. Uh, I can't remember his name. Yeah, but, from yeah. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. And then there are two more that are on, including my position, and Williams are not filled. 
So that's five judges four. right there. Or four, excuse four. me. Yeah. Um, a real opportunity for the president to reshape the court. Well, not entirely. So, for example, one of the candidates for replacing me is a former law clerk of mine. Very, very smart, very successful, created a huge business, and very wealthy, and he's, very, and he's great. And he was uh, nominated by Trump and uh, blocked by Durbin. Mm. Now, they didn't block... Um, the blogger. Uh, Barrett. Oh, was it? Yeah. Barrett. Oh, oh right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, Notre Dame. Right. Well, that'd be a home state senator prerogative, right? You're talking it about blue slipping? Be, yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So it's Joe Donnelly decided time. not to block yes. Barrett. Yeah. So I don't know about the other two, but I didn't really think about it. my The reason I quit, it wasn't so much that the pro se's were getting a raw deal, which they were, but that I wasn't being permitted to help them out at all. So I felt frustrated. That's what I wanted to do. I couldn't do it, so I quit. I wasn't really thinking about a successor at all. Can I ask, uh, you know, I know you have, I think, unique of all your colleagues in the Seventh Circuit, you will do this sitting by designation in the district court, and you've talked a lot about how that's a great experience. Um, I think it should be compulsory. Also for the Supreme Court justice, I think to be an appellate judge and never have conducted a trial, it's ridiculous. It means you don't really know, you don't know like three-fourths of the, of the case. <laughs> yeah. Do you sort of wish for your vacancy to be filled by somebody who has experience as a judge already, as a district court trial level judge, something like that? Well, either that or be committed to conducting trials as a volunteer. Now, the problem is trials are drying up. <laughs> Always practicing attorneys, we're oh. very well aware of that. Oh, well, actually, it's, uh, <laughs> well, my yeah, client keeps yeah. trying Carl cases. Carl <laughs> works for the city, which is well, I never last, in shortage of being sued. Uh, I did two, I conducted two criminal trials in 2016. Maybe it lapped over a month or so in 2017. It was really fun. I enjoyed that. But when I, a couple of months later, I called up the chief judge, you know, Ruben Castillo, and the district court said, I'd like to have another trial. I said, no, we don't have other trials. There are so few to go around that we can't allow, a, you know, an outsider. In fact, you know, it used to be that of people who were indicted, 24% had a trial. Then it went down to 5%. This is federal. Mm -hmm. And now it's down to 1%. Because um, the maximum sentences are so high right. that the prosecutor can go to the defendant and say, look, you know, if you go to trial uh, and lose, the judge could sentence you to 50 years in prison. Now, he probably won't do that, but he could. So why don't we make a deal? We'll go to the judge, we'll say, judge, we've discussed, and so on. And we think eight years is enough. And the defendant agrees. And the judge will say, fine, eight years. So this, this is a <laughs> criticism that often comes up of the federal uh, criminal yeah. judicial system, that prosecutors have so much power to leverage plea bargains like that. It right. essentially becomes exactly. a hedging operation. And I take it you're quite the critic of that. <laughs> Yeah, I do not, I do not approve of that. Well, the problem is, it goes back to Bill Clinton, who created these very high maximum sentences when he was president, and they're a tool for intimidation. They're not often imposed, but they are a tool. So that's that's very unfortunate. Well, of course, but then the sort of the other side is, on the one hand, there's these enormous maximum possible sentences, and so a lot of people plea. But on the other hand, you have the cases that do go to trial are the ones with the stacking mandatory minimums, so you might as well try it because <laughs> you're doing 100 years anyway, right? I mean, this seems to me like there's more than one mm. problem there. And I think I've heard a lot of district court judges, including Judge McCuskey from Central District of Illinois after he retired, say, you know, the biggest problem isn't that everything pleas. The biggest problem is that the prosecutor, because of mandatory minimums, can decide the sentence before anything happens. <laughs> I, but I guess those cases, just because of their nature, maybe not a lot of those 
really actually end up in the Court of Appeals because what is there to talk about if there's just a <laughs> mandatory sentence imposed? Um, yeah, that's true, yeah. That's probably a good place for us to take a break. We'll be right back with our last segment, Stranger Than Legal Fiction. This episode of At The Bar is brought to you by Attorney Protective in partnership with CBA Insurance Agency, a subsidiary of the Chicago Bar Association offering legal malpractice insurance. CBA Insurance Agency will work with you and for you to make sure that you get the most value for your legal malpractice insurance. It's your good name. Let us help you keep it. For a free price estimate, visit attorneyprotective.com backslash CBA podcast. And we're back. Before we wrap up today, we're going to play a game we like to call Stranger Than Legal Fiction. Carl and I have spent (laughs) countless hours wandering around old and largely abandoned law libraries or just poked around Google, like Judge Posner said, (laughs) looking for some of the strangest and most arcane laws that are still on the books. We've each picked one of those real but strange laws. We've each just made another one up completely. And we're going to ask each other and our guest, Judge Posner, which law is real and which law is fake to see which of us can distinguish strange legal fact from fiction. Judge, are you ready? Yeah. Carl, the honors are yours. Yeah, I... I, um I went into the the world of overcriminalization for one of these, and of course the the scourge that is uh, uh, long term parking. So one of these two things is actually a crime. <laughs> Either it's a crime to park at an Illinois State Police facility over the weekend, or it's a crime to park at a post office for more than eighteen hours. Mm. What do you think, Judge? Um. It's a weekend for the police, and it's, did you say, 18 hours for, for the post office. office? Oh, that's hard. I would say the post office. Why? Because clearly, if you're parking at a police station, if the police don't like it, they see the car. They'll, they'll just they'll, tow they'll, it. <laughs> they, don't need, they don't need the help. Right. Yeah. Whereas with a... With a um, Post office, there aren't going to be police sort of haunting the place and looking for people parking. That was just... You know, I usually play the contrarian in these games, but I like that logic. I'm going to go with the judge on this one. <laughs> That's what right. It? There's That's too it? many federal crimes. <laughs> there you go. There are too many federal crimes. Right. 18 hours in a post office parking lot is a federal crime. <laughs> wow. You could be a federal convict. <laughs> what if you just have like a lot of mail to send? I don't know. Yeah. You got to circle. I don't know. You got to bring someone in circle. Yeah. My one criminal conviction in my entire life is a conviction for a federal crime. Not wow. of me, I mean by me as a lawyer. Um, when I was an intern in the U.S. <laughs> Attorney's Office, I got it, my, I have a one, batting a thousand on federal crimes because I got a guy convicted of causing a disturbance at a Veterans Affairs facility. It was just somebody who got into a yelling match with somebody at the VA. I got them convicted after that, a bench trial. that guy trial. was not you. It was not me, yeah. Got them convicted after a bench trial, and they were sentenced to the maximum possible fine for that crime, which was, I believe, two hundred and fifty dollars. Big win, <laughs> big win. I mean, I think that you got to put that in your gravestone. Yeah, yeah. All right. Option number one: It is illegal in Arizona to allow a donkey to sleep in a bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> or Alabama is the only state left in the union in which it is still legal to marry your first cousin. Alabama's obviously been in the news a lot lately, so it came to mind. Judge, what do you think? The first date was? Arizona. Arizona. Oh, let's see. You can see the wheels turning. <laughs> donkey in a bathtub. It's, uh, well, I think I, I would vote for the donkey in the bathtub being the, the, the more serious crime. <laughs> on the theory, that, the theory that there's no possible justification for having a donkey in a bathtub. Okay. It's not fair to the donkey. The donkey could very easily uh, damage the bathtub. <laughs> um, or trip, trying to get out. Especially if the donkey was sure, you know, had uh, shoes, had horseshoes, had donkey shoes. Um, so Richard Posner, animal rights the activist. Other one, you could imagine that as being, you know, permitted activity. Okay. Carl, what do you think? <sighs> Boy, it's Arizona, the whole state, because if it was just Phoenix, I would say that's definitely illegal. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> it's actually a town in Arizona. A town in Arizona. Yes, okay. I should have clarified. Yeah, okay. Well, that's uh, there's lots of crazy towns in Arizona. I'm going to guess... Um, sorry, am I guessing the real one or the fake one? I already The real the one. The real one? Or the fake. It's basically the same thing. I'm going to guess you can marry your first cousin in Alabama with a blood test. I bet you have to get a blood test, but I bet you can do it. So... One is absolutely true, and one is kind of true. <laughs> in fact, it is illegal in Arizona to allow a donkey to sleep in a bathtub. It is illegal. It is illegal. <laughs> so the story goes, I was curious when I found this one, yes. so I looked it up, that a rancher in Kingman County, Arizona, had a donkey who liked to sleep in an abandoned bathtub that he had junked on his ranch. And one day in 1924, a flood came, carried the bathtub, <laughs> and the donkey along with it through the town... Doing a great deal of damage on the way, taking considerable manpower to rescue this darn donkey. And right thereafter, the town passed a law right. that made it illegal to allow donkeys to sleep in and, I suppose, apparently captain a bathtub. Um, Local democracy is the best. It's, right? it's really, I really understand what the founding fathers were thinking <laughs> when they came up with federalism. And you see that Alabama is actually one of 20 states, including the District of Columbia, that still allows you to marry your first cousin. Whoa! Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and other states like Illinois will allow it with certain conditions. So here's the fun part about Illinois. You can marry your first cousin, but only if you're over 50 or infertile. Locks <laughs> <laughs> run out. Yeah, all right. Yep. And That's I think, strangely illogical, isn't it? The uh, over 50 or infertile? I mean, there's still people, you know, in this day and age are still fertile over yeah, 50. But course. that's going to be our episode for today, ending on that high note. I want a th- high note. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, dreaming about donkeys. The only thing that bothers me... Wait, was this a special type of bathtub? Is that you know? I don't. It didn't. Because I don't think a donkey could fit in an ordinary bathtub. Maybe it was a young donkey. I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> That's a good question. I'm going to do some more research when I get back to the office. And I want to thank our guest, retired judge Richard Posner, for joining us and engaging in what is always a fascinating and thought-provoking and turns out pretty fun conversation. I also want to thank everyone who makes this machine run, including my co-host today, Carl Newman, our executive producer, Jen Byrne, as well as our sound crew, Ricardo Islas and Steve Wyrick. Remember, you can follow us and send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CBA at the bar, all one word. Please also rate us and leave us your feedback on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcast. It helps us get the word out. Until next time, for all of us here at the CBA, this is John Amarillo, and we'll see you soon at the bar. Bye.